good evening to everyone in india and good morning and good noon to those who would have joined from other time zones this is rajini here from breakthrough science society karnataka i am hosting today's talk which you are all eagerly awaiting let me start by welcoming you all to the fifth lecture of jr lakshman rao's birth centenary year we have had talks on diverse topics earlier uh, namely india's role in space exploration darwin's theory of evolution interconnectedness of science technology and society and the last talk was how to become a fact checking warrior lakshman rao has left a rich legacy in science to emulate his children brinda vidya anil and anuradha are emotionally involved with this event along with breakthrough science society all of them are passionate about science and to them science is a way of life the love for science is rubbed on to his grandchildren as well professor c n rao one of the foremost scientists in india was in fact a student of professor j r lakshman rao in our humble bid to pay homage to professor j r lakshman rao a pioneer of popular science communication in karnataka founder of institutions like krvp and publications like balavignana an innovator of useful techniques to integrate english words into kannada to enrich science communication with local population a man of diverse interests covering science and scientific thinking music and gender equality social justice and socialism today we have chosen a topic that professor j r lakshman rao practiced all through in his life science communication we have with us today professor padmanabhan balram who is an epitome of science communication today he was a former director of iisc and is the recipient of padma shri and padma bhushan awards professor padmanabhan balram obtained his bsc Uh, in 1967 from pune university msc in 1969 from the iit kanpur and phd in 1972 in chemistry from the carnegie mellon university usa he was a research associate at harvard university between 1972 and 1973 he served on the faculty of the iisc bangalore from 1973 to 2014 he was the director of the institute from 2005 to 2014 he has contributed extensively to the areas of molecular biophysics and chemical biology he was the editor of current science from 1995 to 2013 during which he authored over 300 editorials on diverse subjects related to science and scientists along with the prestigious padma shri in 2002 and padma bhushan in 2014 he is the recipient of the r bruce Mary Field Award 2021 of the American Peptide Society. He is currently associated with the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, as the Department of Science and Technology Year of Science Chair Professor. The chair professorship is presented as a benchmark of performance, stature, value, and eminence in national and international arena. I'll give a very small briefing about uh, today's talk. science and technology dominate the modern world an intuitive understanding of scientific concepts has become necessary in many walks of life the failure of leaders to ignore the results of science has proved disastrous in the present pandemic this talk will discuss the importance of science communication and the difficulties of presenting the complexities of science to the lay public without any further delay i request professor balram to take over over to you professor balram uh, thank you very much uh, dr rajini and i'd like to thank uh, the family of professor lakshman rao for inviting me to give this talk in his honor uh, it's really a privilege i have not met professor lakshman rao but i had the privilege of corresponding with him when i was editor of current science i thought the topic that would be most appropriate would be to discuss in general science scientists and their communication with the public 
Uh, that is summarized by the cartoon that I show you on the first slide. Very often, science and society uh, don't really talk to one another. In India, we celebrate two days, one as National Science Day and the other as National Technology Day. The 28th of February is associated with the discovery of the Raman effect. And the 11th of May is associated with the explosion, the atomic explosions at Pokhran II. Science has become important in the public imagination in the last year or so. This is because of the coronavirus, which is a public health nightmare, but it's an artist's delight. So if you go to the internet, you will find many, many pictures of the coronavirus. Everybody knows what the coronavirus looks like. It was first observed only under the electron microscope. But today, in our imagination, we know that it is the spherical object which spikes all over its surface. One of the best definitions of a virus is that it's a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. And I will come back to this definition a little bit later. But in the first phase of the pandemic, which happened last year, the coronavirus really caught the imagination of everybody. These kinds of pictures appeared in the popular press, both in India as well as abroad. In India, policemen were trying to persuade everybody to observe lockdowns. Whereas in France and Italy, the first phase had passed and they had now begun to celebrate and they were making Easter eggs out of uh, with the shape of the coronavirus. In order to understand the coronavirus, we need to understand biology and we need to understand medicine. But it, the subject that really links biology and medicine is chemistry. And chemistry, of course, is the subject which Professor Lakshman Rao studied. Chemistry has been described wonderfully by Arthur Kornberg. Kornberg is the biochemist who discovered the enzyme DNA polymerase and fired the first shot of the biotechnology revolution. Kornberg called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. Yet it is the subject which very often the public finds it most difficult to appreciate. On the internet, you will find this cartoon. Here's a man solving a crossword puzzle and he says, what's a nine letter word for biotechnology? His wife answers immediately, chemistry. I might ask you another question. What is a nine letter word for material science or what today is called nanotechnology? The answer once again will be chemistry. In 2014, several years ago, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences conducted a survey. They do a lot of these surveys in America and this was a comparison of the views that the general public has and what scientists have. Question asked is, say, is it safe to eat genetically modified food? 88% of scientists felt it was safe, but only 37% of American adults felt it was safe. Do you favor the use of animals in research? 89% of scientists said yes, only 47% of the general population said yes. Human beings have evolved over time. Is this statement acceptable? The American Academy of Sci Arts and Scientists scientists found 98% agreed with this statement, but only 65% of people appeared to have an understanding of what evolution meant. Coming somewhat closer to problems of today, climate change is mostly due to human activity. 87% of scientists feel so, but only 50% of the general public feels so. So it's not only in India, but even in the most advanced countries of the world, the perceptions about science and scientific subjects which require science is much, much poorer among the general population. There are several cartoons that you will find about uh, genetic engineering. Here's one. You have minister, here's the pesticide resistant cop. 
And then, of course, a caveat. A species which can eat it is in the pipeline. In order to understand this cartoon, you need to know a little bit of science. But then at the other corner of my slide, you will find that the last American president, for example, did not like science. He did not like any discussion of the environment. He didn't like climate change. He didn't like any discussion of energy. Many things he did not like, and many of them were connected with science. Today, if you look at America, you will find that politics really dominates the public perception of science. Republicans are somewhat more anti-science, uh, Democrats sort of lean towards the lessons of science. We know this in India. In India, for example, politicians and science are sometimes generally divorced from one another. Here's an example. A few years ago, a union minister, he left the union ministry sometime later, uh, said that Darwin will be proved wrong in 20 years. He went on to add that he was a science student and he's convinced that his ancestors were not apes. He had an argument here. He said nobody's ever seen an ape turn, turn into a man. This, of course, showed a profound misunderstanding of Darwinian evolution. But at the same time, you will find that this misunderstanding of Darwinian evolution is not confined to politicians in India. It spread all over the world. More recently, in 2019, the then Uttarakhand chief minister said that only cows breathe out oxygen. And then a cartoonist, of course, and this was before the COVID pandemic, there was no oxygen shortage, but he drew this cartoon where he said that people could just be hooked up to a cow then and they would get their oxygen. But what did this reveal? This revealed a profound misunderstanding of life itself, of how the air that we breathe is important, not only to us, but to animals, and how animals and human beings are related. This actually tells you the unity of biology. It also tells you the unity of the underlying biochemistry and therefore the underlying chemistry. But it's not only politicians, it is sometimes the judiciary. Here, for example, from the pulpit of the Rajasthan High Court, a judge on the eve of his retirement said that peacocks don't have sex, that the peahen gets pregnant, drinking the tears of the peacock. Now, this again is a profound misunderstanding of the imperatives of biology. The imperatives of biology are really reproduction of the species, survival of the species. And therefore, all biological species reproduce. So we must ask some questions. If one is going to communicate, what is science? How is science done? And is science useful? I've decorated this slide with cartoons which I've picked off from the internet. And you will find that there are cartoons about scientists who like to write papers. There's a cartoon which says they already wrote the paper. That's why it's so hard to get the right data. This is important. Sometimes scientists do this. Here's another cartoon which says, now that we've developed the side effects, let's go for the cure. And uh, physics trash talk. And your mom thinks Newton's second law replaced Newton's first law. Many times we do not know what is the understanding that the public has about science, sometimes even the understanding that scientists have about science. What does science seek to study? Science seeks to study nature. And it's sort of interesting that the two most influential periodicals in science are called Nature, coming from Britain, and Science, coming from the United States. What is the definition of nature? You can't do better than Goethe's definition, a German poet, written sometimes in 1780, but reproduced in translation by Thomas Huxley in the very first editorial which appeared in the journal Nature in the year 1869. And here is Goethe in translation. 
nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. So that's nature. But here I draw your attention to a book. If you haven't seen it, you should get it and look at it. This is Jacob Bronowski's Ascent of Man. The Ascent of Man is a book based on a BBC television series which Bronowski produced in the late in the early 1970s. And here he describes what the ascent of man is. And he says, among the multitude of animals which scamper, fly, burrow and swim around us, man is the only one who is not locked into his environment. His imagination, his reason, his emotional subtlety and toughness make it possible for him not to accept the environment but to change it. And that series of inventions by which man from age to age has remade his environment is a different kind of evolution, not biological, but cultural evolution. I call that brilliant sequence of cultural peaks, the ascent of man. What is cultural evolution? Cultural evolution is dependent upon evolution of science and technology throughout the ages, from the time that fire was invented, from the time that tools were invented, metal tools, stone tools, these were scientific inventions, the invention of agriculture, the domestication of animals, dairy farming, all of these were inventions of human beings a long time ago, long before culture as we know it evolved. Today, culture is very often associated with language. It's associated with religion. But if you look more deeply, and I will come back to this towards the very end of my presentation, it is also linked to science and technology and the development of science ever since the cognitive revolution. Last year, just before the beginning of the pandemic, uh, two years ago, this article appeared in Scientific American, which defined what was called a science tool. And this tool rests on three elements, data, theory and communication. I merely took this article and put a stool in the middle and the three legs on which the stool stand are this. So science works with data, science requires theories and eventually science requires communication. It requires communication between scientists and it requires communication between scientists and the environment. I've decorated the slide on its far corners with famous scientists. Scientists who were responsible for our understanding of the universe, of blood circulation, of our understanding of vaccines and of understanding of evolution. All of them important today. But what is most important for science? Science needs its tools, and there are just two tools which have opened up both the universe which we cannot see, vast, and also a universe which we cannot see because it's too small, microbiology. Galileo's telescope and Leeuwenhoek's microscope have really opened up our eyes to things that we can't see. Otherwise, science was based largely on phenomena that we can observe. What are the ways of doing science? One is you can simply observe and classify. That's what Darwin did. He observed and classified. That's what Mendeleev did. He observed and classified. We got natural selection on the one hand and the periodic table on the other. These are the foundational pillars of biology on the one hand and chemistry on the other. Pasteur in the 19th century advanced another way of doing science. You do experiment and you make observations. And he, of course, was the man who gave us this famous dictum that chance favors the prepared mind. Pasteur worked in diverse fields. He was the founding father of stereochemistry, the connection between molecular structure and optical activity. He also gave us microbiology and vaccines. So Pasteur was the real exemplar of doing experiments and making observations. 
The other exemplar of the experimental method was Michael Faraday. Faraday, of course, gave us electromagnetic induction, and his experiments were so famous, famously performed in the Royal Institution. If you ask yourself, and those of you who are in Bangalore will realize that traffic jams are very common in Bangalore, and almost every street has become a one-way street. Which was the world's first one-way street? That's the street in front of the Royal Institution in London. What caused the traffic jam there? It was Faraday demonstrating experiments in the lectures that he gave at the Royal Institution. Who came to hear him? It was the Victorian ladies dressed in their fine dresses. They would not walk. They would come in horse-drawn carriages. The carriages would park in front of the Royal Institution and they would go in. After some time, the road would simply be blocked and nobody can go in. It was then that the mayor of London declared the street in front of the Royal Institution a one-way street. But the experiments that Faraday did, the experiments that Pasteur did, they needed a theoretical underpinning to understand them. Those theories came from physics. Clark Maxwell's unification of electricity, magnetism, and magically out of this unification emerged light. There's nothing more beautiful than that. We understood what electromagnetic radiation was. And Boltzmann, thinking about heat, what is heat, came to statistical mechanics, the idea of entropy, the idea of atoms moving everywhere. And in The Ascent of Man, Bronowski pays this tribute to Boltzmann. He says, to whom more than anyone else, we owe the fact that the atom, the world within a world, is as real to us now as our own world. And Boltzmann actually was worried about heat, a phenomenon. And he asked, where, what is heat? And then he came to the idea of atoms and atoms ceaselessly moving around. If you've looked at Richard Feynman's lectures on physics, right at the beginning in his introduction, he will start, matter is made of atoms. And then he asks a question at the end of the chapter. If in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed, and only one sentence passed on to the next generations of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? Feynman answers his question. He says, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact or whatever you wish to call it, that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling one another when they are pushed too close to one another. So you can see there's beauty in understanding of science. There are two subjects which are necessary to help us understand physics on the one hand and biology on the other. One is mathematics, which Galileo said is the language with which God wrote the universe. The other is chemistry, which we might say is the language with which nature wrote the book of life. Chemical structures are the alphabets of chemistry. Symbols and equations are the alphabets of mathematics. So for, for, for both subjects, one has to learn a language first and then only learn the subject. Physics and biology are somewhat easier to relate to from real experience. Physics and Newton, for example, are easier to understand than a lot of chemistry and mathematics. Similarly, biology is easy to understand. After all, we experience our own bodies. We see animals, we see plants. So we see biology every day. Professor Lakshman Rao's subject, chemistry, has a very poor public perception. Cartoons that you will find say everybody will run away from chemicals. But what I found when I looked through was that politicians like both chemistry and arithmetic. Every time we have an election, chemistry and arithmetic are the metaphors which are used. The old Bihar elections a few years ago, when Nitish Kumar and Lalu Yadav hugged one another, was described in these words. Arun Jaitley said it's about chemistry, not arithmetic. But the Hindu which said it was good arithmetic, but no chemistry. And as always, the Hindu was proved right, because after a little while, the alliance broke up. In later elections we've had, mathematics is fine, but it's chemistry that wins polls. And then, of course, you might see pictures like this where Nitish Kumar changes sides yet once again. 
and you might label the slide as new chemistry but old mathematics because you need a majority. But I must for politicians give the last word to our Prime Minister. He said on the 27th of May 2019, chemistry defeated arithmetic in the 2019 polls. What are the foundational pillars of chemistry? I have them here. Mendeleev exemplifies diversity. Wohler exemplifies unity, and I'll come to this in a moment. Boltzmann exemplifies dynamics, and Pasteur exemplifies structure. Wohler is the man who took ammonium cyanate, heated it, and got urea. Urea was a natural substance found in urine. Here he had taken inorganic substance and found, converted it into a substance that is found in biology. And then he wrote a letter to Berzelius in which he said, in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. Where does all this chemistry come from? You require the elements. Where do they come from? They come from the stars. And Bronowski said it wonderfully. He said, in all the stars, there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structures. And then he says, matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin in biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. This is why we must worry about the word evolve, evolution. He asks about carbon. Carbon, for instance, is formed in a star when three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second, 10 to the minus 12 of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. What does this mean? Life itself is improbable. It's improbable. It's happened on Earth. And many people ask the question, why is life the way it is? Why is biochemistry the way it is? We should not be afraid of chemistry. On the left is a Western advertisement which advertises chemical free cleaning products. And on the right is an Indian advertisement which says, stop punishing your hands with chemical based phenyl. Now it turns out that even Baba Ramdev with all the powers that he has cannot make a substance which does not have a chemical. And you must remember that chemicals are all around us. There's no material on earth which is not chemical in nature. So one is chemistry, you are made of chemistry, you are made of chemicals, and so too is everything around you. Now, when we talk generally about science and the perception of what science has done, one might ask in the 20th century, what was the most important scientific advance of the 20th century? In the year 2000, 1999, 2000, the journal Nature commissioned a weekly essay where famous people wrote about what they thought was the most important advance of the 20th century. I used to read these regularly, but there's only one essay which has stayed in my mind, and that's the one I have on this slide. This was written by the Canadian scientist Václav Smil, and he says this, the world might be better off without Microsoft and CNN, and neither nuclear reactors nor space shuttles are critical to human well-being. But the world's population would not have grown from 1.6 billion to today's 6 billion without the Haber-Bosch process. What is the Haber-Bosch process? Václav Smell called it the detonator of the population explosion. And what it is, is the industrial synthesis of ammonia from gaseous hydrogen and gaseous hydrogen at high pressure, high temperature with a catalyst. This is what is called the Haber-Bosch process. And today you will learn it in 12th class chemistry. If it had not been for the industrial synthesis of ammonia in the early decades of the 20th century, we would not have had urea. The industrial synthesis of urea gave us fertilizer. And the first agricultural revolution of the 20th century is a chemical revolution. Nature makes ammonia, 
It fixes atmospheric nitrogen. And this is where biochemistry is so wonderful. It does it at room temperature and in aqueous solution. But it is done by bacteria. The Harbour story also illustrates the moral dilemmas of science. Harbour not only gave us the industrial synthesis of ammonia, he also gave us Zyklon B, which produces hydrogen cyanide. And it is with hydrogen cyanide that Hitler killed millions of Jews. It also turns out that Harbour was the man who led the chlorine gas attack at Yapres in the First World War. I'll show you another chemical, DDT, has the formidable name dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. When Mueller discovered DDT, he got the Nobel Prize almost immediately after because scientists found that DDT was very efficient as a contact poison against insects. It killed the insects which caused malaria, the Anopheles mosquito. It also killed the insects which were pests eating up crops and therefore you had a one simple molecule acting in both agriculture and medicine. But some years later this book appeared written by a nurse Rachel Carson called Silent Spring 1962. What Carson said was this, we are rightly appalled by the genetic effects of radiation. How then can we be indifferent to the same effect in chemicals that we disseminate widely in our environment? Because by this time Carson had become worried about the effects of chemicals. Radiation, we know, has terrible effects. Hiroshima and Nagasaki demonstrated that. This is the classic book which began the environmental movement. So in science, there are always two sides to a scientific advance. You have wonderful consequences. You might sometimes also have side effects. But let me come back to the virus. Peter Medawa, the English immunologist, said this of a virus. Inasmuch as viruses are made known only by their causing disease or other pathological changes, the existence of benign viruses having no ill effects remains conjectural. No virus is known to do good. It has been well said that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. So now if you look at the coronavirus, you might ask, what is the coronavirus made up of? What, those spiky projections that you see, they are proteins. Most of the things that cover the surface of the sphere are lipids or proteins. And it's only inside the sphere is the genetic material, the nucleic acid. We must know a great deal about the coronavirus to appreciate whether these news reports are true or not. Today, I saw this report that the first case of Delta Plus variant has been uh, found in Karnataka. Is this alarming news? We must ask ourselves. The Delta variant is already there. In what way is Delta Plus different from Delta? Is it going to spread faster? Probably not. Is it going to be more virulent? Probably not. Is it going to evade antibodies produced by vaccines? Maybe, but nobody knows. Should, should these uncertainties determine public policy? This is a matter for discussion. Therefore, a knowledge of science is needed for those who discuss policy and who are responsible for making policy. When you try to think about mutations in the virus, remember this, that biology deals with organisms and their behavior. But the two foundational pillars of biology erected in the 19th century are genetics by Mendel and evolution by Darwin. What do they mean? Genetics means the transmission of characteristics from one generation to the next, from one generation of the virus to the next generation of the virus. But there will be changes. How do those changes happen? Those changes happen because of chemistry, which links genetics and evolution. It's the chemistry of the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Oswald Avery's discovery that DNA is the genetic material is one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. The Watson Crick double helix is now immortalized in the scientific literature. It is mutational changes in DNA and RNA which are responsible for variation. But Darwin gave us the idea of natural selection. Variation happens. Nature then selects. 
So you must understand evolution. And as Dubzhansky said famously in the early 70s, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But when talks to a general public, and this is what the, is the conversation in America, does the evolutionary doctrine clash with religious faith? Dubzhansky said many years ago, it does not. It is a blunder to mistake the holy scriptures for elementary textbooks of astronomy, geology, biology, and anthropology. Only if symbols are construed to mean what they are not intended to mean, can there arise imaginary insoluble conflicts. Even in India, we must remember this. There is no conflict between science and religion. But in presenting science to society, we have to ask some questions. Can basic scientific research lead to useful technology? And an even more important question to be asked in India today. Can new technologies emerge in an environment that does not support science? There are three words in the English language with which all of you are familiar. Discovery, invention and innovation. Even when I was a young faculty member at the Indian Institute of Science, I knew of the words discovery and innovation, invention. I had not heard of the word innovation. That came later. Penicillin was a discovery. The light bulb was a purposeful invention by Edison, who could have discovered the electron, but instead he illuminated our lives. Relativity, where do you place it? This was an invention of the human mind, maybe. Where do you put innovation? Innovation can be of all kinds. And this sometimes can be also in business, where the innovation is the starting of retail stores, today of e-commerce and so on. What has basic science given us? It's given us many things. X-rays, for example, in the dying years of the 19th century, at the very beginning of the 20th century, Ronchon discovered X-rays. He was simply in investigating cathode rays and had placed a fluorescent plate somewhat distant from his tube. And he called his wife in and told her to put her hand in front. And that's the image of Ronchon's wife's hand. She had a wonderful reaction. When she saw this image, she said, I have seen death because you can see the skeletal image of the bones. This is the beginning of x-rays. And x-rays now have great application in science. But initially, the only people who liked x-rays were, the, were physicians because they saw the potential of diagnostics here. X-rays made their impact and began the field of radiology. Many, many years later, several decades later, Paul Lotterber produced this image of two concentric glass tubes in water. There are two images of water placed in two concentric tubes. And uh, look at the picture that he got. You could image them. You would not have imagined that this is of any use to anybody. This led to magnetic resonance imaging and a Nobel Prize to Lotterbach many years later. So the two driving techniques of radiology today are X-rays and NMR imaging, magnetic resonance imaging. These are both the products of basic science. Look at the Raman effect, for example. Raman was interested in light scattering. An interest that he got by looking at the color of the sea on the first voyage that he made. Raleigh had suggested that it was the reflection of the sky in the sea that gave it its characteristic color. Raman began to investigate light scattering by liquids and discovered the Raman effect, a change of frequency when light passed through the liquid. Did Raman think it was going to be useful? Probably not. We can't ask him today. But many, many years, long after Raman passed away, it turns out that Raman spectroscopy, the Raman effect itself, has many, many applications. Everything from airport security to trying to fingerprint molecules in the universe. Today in Karnataka, we always hear the words ITBT, Information Technology and Biotechnology. I think we even have a ministry. These are the dominant technologies of our times. They have their roots in fundamental science. Information technology begins with Claude Shannon's work on the mathematical theory of communication. 
Biotechnology begins with Oswald Avery's understanding of DNA as the genetic material. Both of these are in the mid 1940s. So if one wants to communicate science to the public, and it is that science communication that Professor Lakshman Rao was involved in so deeply, you have to ask the question, how do you communicate science to the public? It's very, very difficult. You will find books and books. You'll find old books and you will find new books. But science communicators must also know what to select and what to communicate. How do you write, for example, for a popular audience? JBS Haldane once wrote an essay, and I will read from his essay. For those you have who may not be familiar, Haldane came and spent his last years in India. He was one of the most interesting scientists of the 20th century, who had an extraordinarily wide range of accomplishments. He was at the Indian Statistical Institute for some time before retiring to Bhubaneswar. Haldane and Mahal Nobis are pictured in the bottom left of the slide. Haldane says this, In what follows I shall give some hints on how to do it, but let no reader suppose that my method is the only one. And this is the part that I liked. He says, Literary synthesis is like organic chemical synthesis. The method to be adopted depends on the product required, the raw material and the apparatus available. As my brain is my apparatus and different from yours, my methods will also differ from yours. And then he says, for literature has its technique like science. And unless you set yourself a fairly high standard, you will get nowhere. So don't expect to succeed at your first or even your second attempt. For whom are you writing? This is an even more important question than the choice of subject. So he really tells communicators what they ought to be thinking about. But every communicator must develop their own individual style. And I think Professor Lakshman Rao's style would have been a hard one to follow for many people. That was his own unique style. But finally, as I come to the end of my presentation, I want to turn to a question which should interest many of you. Is there a connection between history and biology? Because when in the early stages of human being, of human evolution, humans were also animals. They were hunter-gatherers. That's all they were. They would hunt for their food. They would gather it they would retreat to eat their food. They worked in small groups of people much the same way that animals did. Even today, there are hunter-gatherers. They can be found in the remote Andaman Islands, slowly getting altered by modern influences. I draw your attention to this book. Many of you may have read it. If you haven't, take a look. This is the book Sapiens, written by an Israeli historian, Yuval Harari. It was for a while on the bestseller lists. He calls this a brief history of humankind. And he says this, the immense diversity of imagined realities that Sapiens invented and the resultant diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we call cultures. Once cultures appeared, they never ceased to change and develop. And these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. The cognitive revolution is accordingly the point when history declared its independence from biology. When did the cognitive revolution happen? The development of the brain. This happened when human societies became more stationary. What made them stationary and what made them aggregate into societies? It was the invention of agriculture because food is the most important thing. So once you invented agriculture, you invented dairy farming, you stayed in one place. And if you stayed in one place, you had to protect your fields. How do you protect your fields? You need to organize. And how do you organize? You need to form a society. How do you form a society? You need to have some myths which will bind the society together. And he says here, from the cognitive revolution onwards, 
historical narratives replace biological theories as our principal means of explaining the development of Homo sapiens. He says, to understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interaction of genes, hormones and organisms. It is necessary to take into account the interaction of ideas, images and fantasies as well. So it is important even for scientists to understand what those people who harp on cultures mean. You must understand the other people in order to be able to explain your own discipline. The cartoonist R.K. Lakshman, incomparable and absolutely the best observer of our times, used to draw wonderful cartoons. And this one is one of my favorites. Lakshman's common man always looked bewildered when he looked out and saw what was happening. And here there was, many years ago, long before the Istro became as uh, important as it is today, in the early days of Istro, there was already talk of a man on the moon project. The Apollo missions had been successful. Everybody wanted eventually to place a man on the moon. And there, of course, is a scientist. He brings Lakshman's common man into the space center, says, this is our man. He can survive without water, food, light, air, and shelter. And in this one cartoon, he really pictured the vast gulf that separates scientists on the one hand, busy with their own projects, and a vast mass of society which struggles for everyday existence. It is that understanding which must be there if scientists are to effectively communicate with society. Finally, I would like to thank once again the organizers of this series of lectures, an opportunity to be able to speak to you and to also to acknowledge on this very last slide the two institutions where I have spent much of my scientific career. The Indian Institute of Science where I spent over 42 years and the National Center for Biological Sciences, which is now my home in my retirement days. Both these institutions have provided a wonderful ambience in which one can read, think and write whatever one wants to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Balram. It was indeed an exciting lecture. Uh, the audience also seemed to be uh, giving the kind of uh, reaction there, an informative talk, an excellent talk. The need of that is uh, science communication, so on and so forth. Uh, it was a uh, um, history brought uh, to our uh, eyes and then made it made relevant to the present times. The importance of science communication, the gulf between uh, what scientists are doing and the public perception of science. Uh, I, as I am um, just waiting uh, for a few questions, I have one question here from uh, Mr. Vilas. Why is science communication not so popular in native languages as compared to English? You know, I can answer that question very easily because I cannot write in my own mother tongue. Okay. Now, this is just an unfortunate fact of one's own upbringing and the opportunities that one has had to learn languages. So I think there are some people who are gifted with language and I think they should use their gifts to be able to communicate. I think there are many, many people. Some of us are tremendously handicapped uh, in this sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's another question uh, to you, sir. What is the role played by regional languages in the field of science communication? Very I think this is yeah, yes, I, I will say this. In my view, it is very important. Like, for example, however much I try, I can only reach out to the people who can understand me. I cannot now reach out to the people who cannot understand me. I would need a translator. 
and uh, a lot gets lost in translation. So it's much better to have the original. So I think uh, regional languages are absolutely important if we want to communicate with most of the people in India. Otherwise, how would you do it? I think today, for example, coronavirus, what I would call facts and myths, uh, it's very important to communicate them to everybody. Uh, yes. Yes, Professor. I also uh, know an initiative with this Indian scientist response to COVID-19. They did come up with a series of facts and charts or myths and realities of science in all the regional languages possible. That was a good, uh, at least a reach uh, possible. But COVID, yeah, there's another question. With changing technologies, how do you see science communication changing? Or like, what are the new options of science communication in the present day technological world? No, I think, uh, you know, first thing I should tell the questioner is this. I'm old and I never thought I would learn anything after a certain age. And uh, in my post retirement years, I've learned far more than I've learned in all the years before that, because uh, all kinds of technologies are available. For a little while, I was recruited by some young ladies who were doing a podcast, and I did this for them for a while until they folded up. And I had never heard of the utility of podcasts until then. And now the virus has taught us so many things. We've been online all the time, and uh, we've got used to it. So I think science communication and uh, new technologies are made for each other. You're very right, sir. In fact, most of us uh, wouldn't have heard you uh, without uh, the technology. At least I have uh, heard all of your talks on many YouTube channels that are available, you know, the Dialogue, the Living Science, um, the LIS Academy, Pravega of IASC, all the talks that you gave, and they are online, and we are able to hear you. You know, that's one of the best things uh, that has happened. And there's another question. Uh, from Praveen Subara, do you think Indian media is neglecting science communication? No, actually, I don't think Indian media is neglecting science communication. In fact, nowadays, I find at least the newspapers that I see have a lot. Uh, the Indian Express at its back, and Indian Express was not noted for science communication now has every day something or the other picked up and then uh, made into a form of a digest and put at the back. And some of it's pretty good. And the Hindu has a lot of uh, science articles. And I think this is true of most newspapers now. But unfortunately, a lot of things which are there are uncritical, especially when they talk about advances that are being made in Indian laboratories. We should be realistic. Because I think if the science public finds a new therapeutic for every disease every other day, but nothing ever happens in the clinic, uh, then of course they will believe they will not believe anything that a science journalist writes. I think there should be more explanation and uh, trying to bre break this barrier to understanding. You know, even scientists need it. Like I can understand in my own disciplines, but in another discipline, I would like an article written uh, in just the same way that uh, any other person would like the article written. The only Maybe. difference between me and a lay person in another discipline is because I'm a scientist, I've got a little more discipline in reading uh, what I don't understand. But even I lose my concentration after some time. So it's important. <laughs> <laughs> and also maybe the assumption that, um, you know, people know some things. Uh, mm. We can start from something that they know has to be completely given up. You know, we should start from uh, the point that, you know, you're explaining it to somebody not knowing anything at all. I don't know, maybe. Like, I, say, for a biologist, a virus, a bacteria, the usage of paramecium protozoa are so easy. We've read it over years. But then when you try to tell it to 
uh, somebody who does not have a background with that uh, becomes you know i think one of the problems with scientists and teachers in general uh, is that uh, they should assume nothing uh, because this is very important for them much more so than for the audience it's only when you assume nothing that you realize that you are not able to explain yes very true sir <laughs> very true <laughs> yes there are a few more questions here what role do science what role does scientists vanity play in creating the reality that the general public is not in sync with the thinking of scientists okay i think this is only a misconception you see anybody who's reasonably interested can understand what you're saying so i don't think there is a necessity beyond being a little bit explanatory there's no need to dumb down anything when talking to a general audience i generally found the general audiences react very well if they don't understand something they ask you and sometimes you then realize that you don't understand it well enough to explain it to them okay this Perfect. is <laughs> this is a problem and then in the next time you do it you also uh, are a little bit uh, more explanatory yeah and there's there's one question there should scientists come out of their ivory towers and spare some time to communicate science to the general public yeah i think scientists should not think that uh, they are any different from anybody else I, you know science is just another profession and uh, there are good people there are very poor people there are mediocre people there are average people and it has to be true in any profession it cannot be otherwise and therefore i think they should try their best to communicate with uh, uh, others too it's very important because then only you get public support very true sir yeah the last the last cartoon really resounds that uh, the gap between common man and the real science that's happening unless that is bridged uh, the common man will not understand what's happening that's very true there's another question here uh, where does india stand in science research compared to other countries are there enough measures to encourage the young and talented to take up research yeah you know i wouldn't like to be uh, misquoted on this but my view is that indian science is not doing as well as it ought to be doing in 2021 and uh, we've had about 20 plus years of uh, much greater support for science than there was uh, in the preceding 30 40 years and therefore we ought to be doing much better but then scientific institutions have also suffered from many other problems which are there but in more recent times i don't think government has been very supportive or very encouraging of science and i think in today's world i sometimes i'm happy to be old uh because i don't think uh, people who are young have uh, uh, enough institutions to fulfill their aspirations we have a lot of institutions but not all of them will fulfill the aspirations of the people who are coming to them we need to have a much larger scientific enterprise than what we have today but it also has to be of a higher quality we need to aspire to this you know and collectively do this very powerful words sir um there's one another question please talk about cultural impediments to communicating and understanding science by the public yeah one of the major cultural impediments there is in india is that in a strange and peculiar way religion and superstition have got interconnected and uh, 
this should not be. Religion is something else. Superstition is something else. And uh, the two different uh, aspects altogether of human thinking. Uh, science itself has no conflict with religion and any belief that anybody might have. But sometimes it might conflict with superstitions that one might have. And these superstitions are very common, not only in India, but they are there in, uh, uh, also in, 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 in the Western world too. But what disturbs me most is sometimes a misunderstanding of science and a poor understanding of science among scientists and professionals. See, first of all, the general public doesn't mean the people who have not had the opportunity to have an education. In fact, the people who have not been educated have robust common sense. They are actually observers and understand they are empirical. On the other hand, when you find doctors not understanding indiscriminate use of antibiotics, for instance, it worries you. When you find doctors not understanding the use of antibiotics in viral infections, it worries you. So this is because a medical course does not have enough of a component of microbiology because that's considered a basic science. But I think when we say understanding, or for all of us, there's a need to understand many things. And if you think about it deeply, we find we don't understand. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, there's another question. One of the problems in communicating science to the general public is the use of too many technical terms. Is it uh, not necessary to communicate science with very few technical terms if we aspire to reach out to the general public? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, you should avoid jargon as far as possible. Uh, this is, I think, very important even in purely scientific seminars. Because the most useful input comes from someone who is not in the field. And the greatest impediment to listening to a seminar in today's biology, for example, is that the title will contain three abbreviations. And then after that, the talk will be mostly abbreviations. And you have no idea what the speaker is talking about. And uh, a good fraction of the audience has PhDs, and they can't tell you a word of what they understood when they come out of the talk. So I think uh, even for communication amongst scientists, there's a huge need to avoid jargon altogether. Yes, you, you, you are talking in such uh, you know, words that should be mentioned as, uh, you know, uh, golden words for everybody to carry for a long time. Uh, very thanks a lot. So there's another question. Scientists look at an issue from okay. Scientists look at a given issue with uh, different angles. Will it not confuse the common man and lead to loss of faith or confidence in science? No, I don't think this should happen because I don't think scientists should look at any issue differently from the common man, okay? Because they are also common only, in, except <laughs> in, in the area in which they are specialized. And sometimes scientists are so over-specialized, they are even more common in other fields than a generalist, who may be more widely read in those fields. So I don't think this is true. If you tell me a specific example, I can answer that. Where would a scientist think differently from a common man? Do you have an example where you think that the scientists, maybe not all scientists think differently from common? Maybe if uh, Mr. Venkat Ramana Udupa, if you have an uh, you know, example, you, you could just put it in the uh, chat. So uh, I think that's, 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 these are the number of questions that we have uh, had today. Just seeing and waiting if there's any more.
or if you have missed anything. Uh, there's a question. Um, do you have a message to the young minds who wish to communicate science in, in a country like India? No message, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and it, the more you do it, uh, the better you will get at it. That's what Haldane says, no? Uh, you never worry about negative feedback that you get when you first try. And uh, you will get better with practice. Excellent, sir. Yeah, there's another question. Do you visualize a time when science and scientific thinking becomes people's agenda? No, I don't visualize such a time. I don't even know whether I want such a time. You see, the, uh, life is interesting really because of the diversity of opinions, uh, views, everything that you hear. As long as uh, your skepticism of science doesn't do any harm to anybody, you're absolutely, I would say, free to be a skeptic. Uh, see, today, why are we worried about people who will not take a vaccine? We are worried about people who will not take a vaccine because they may otherwise get infected. And if they become infected, that might become a public health problem. But otherwise, if somebody believes, for instance, that the earth is flat, I wouldn't argue with him because he's happy with it. Uh, he isn't causing anybody any damage. On the other hand, if someone felt that uh, a human sacrifice was necessary to uh, get over some ailment or the other, this I would think is absolutely intolerable. So I think we ought to be very accommodating in uh, pushing a scientific agenda because if you only think about science, you can be extremely unimaginative. <laughs> uh, you need a little bit of poetic license, you know, to uh, imagine. Yes. There's another question. Um, it's a nice question. Can you share any interesting incident as the editor of Current Science? I'll share with you the only thing which is relevant to today's lecture, which I told Professor Lakshman Rao and Anil just before we started this. You know, when I was editor of Current Science, I got an article which drew connections between Western classical music and Carnatic music. This was all about notes and uh, science behind uh, Western classical music and uh, Carnatic classical music. Now, I must confess that when I saw this note, it was written by one of India's most famous scientists, Dr. Raja Ramana. And he was a very powerful man at that time. He was the chairman of the Council of the Indian Institute of Science. And I was only a mere faculty member in the Indian Institute of Science. But I was the editor. So when I got uh, his article, I looked at it. I said, wonderful. What a nice article. And I must say that I know nothing about music, uh, Western classical or Carnatic. So I'm absolutely ignorant. I decided it's wonderful. Uh, we'll publish it. So we published it. And then I get this letter. And this letter is from Mysore. And this was a brutal criticism of Ramana's article. And it started off, I don't remember it exactly. I could probably find out. It said something like Dr. Raja Ramana doesn't know either classical music or Carnatic music or something like this. So once I got this letter from Mysore, I'm a fair editor. So I felt that I must publish it because of criticism. But the, I would send the letter to the author. So I sent the letter to Dr. Ramana. And so Dr. Ramana read this letter and he was, of course, furious. So the first thing is he wrote me a letter saying this uh, writer doesn't know what he's talking about and you cannot publish his letter. But I did not know because he didn't give any reason as to why I should not publish this letter other than Ramana's opinion that the writer did not know what he was talking about. So I said, that's not enough. I want a response from you. 
I am going to publish the letter because you have not made any rebuttal. So I'm giving you the chance to make a rebuttal. So this matter ended at that point. I didn't get a reply. I got a call then from uh, Professor Sienna Rao. And uh, he was not our director. He had retired as the director at that time. And then he told me, see, Ramana called me and he seemed terribly upset about something that you're doing at Current Science. And a lot of things I used to do at Current Science used to upset Professor Sienna Rao. So when he called me, he said, uh, what is it you're doing? Uh, I said, look, I got this letter. This is what the story is all about, just as I've told you. And uh, he said, Who's, what's the name of the man who wrote the letter? So I said, it's a man whom I don't know. He's called J.R. Lakshman Rao. And Sienna Rao said, oh, Lakshman Rao, yeah, 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 you do whatever you like. He didn't tell me very much about why, but I was very happy here. Sienna says, you do whatever you like. So he doesn't want to interfere. So I published that letter and Ramana was unhappy with me till the end of his days. Uh, it's only later that I realized that Professor Lakshman Rao was Sienna Rao's teacher. And he was mildly amused because I think his critique of Ramana's knowledge of music amused him no end. But this is probably the most amusing incident that I've had. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it with all of us. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the Mr. Venkat Ramana Udupa has come back. He says, um, you know, this, this question is uh, regarding scientists having varied opinions on a given topic and that would confuse the public to take a view. His specific example is different scientists have different views about um, which vaccine is better. Yes, I think uh, in the present scenario, there is this perpetual discussion with Covaxin and Covishield. And uh, I think, I don't think an answer to this question is going to be found. Both vaccines are effective to the extent that has been published so far, maybe 60%, 70% efficacy. That's pretty good. So I would take either vaccine without worrying too much about it because these are the only two vaccines which are currently available. And they afford you considerable protection from the coronavirus. Now, coronavirus may still get past you, okay? But doesn't matter because vaccinated people generally have come out at least so far with slightly milder infections than other people. But occasionally there would be the case of a problem. But that's no reason to worry too much about this difference of scientific opinion. The vaccines in America are completely different. They are the mRNA vaccines, which will probably eventually come to India. All these vaccines work differently. The technology behind them is different. But I suspect all of them, between nothing and 70%, I would take 70%. If I had 99% available, I would take 99%. Not available. No way. Thank you, sir. Hope that uh, really answers uh, Mr. Venkatramana. Then there's another uh, question. Is it possible for human beings to be completely rational in both thought and deed? After all, there is an irrational component in every human life. Yes, you've asked a question and you have tried to provide me with an answer, but I'll give you an answer. Uh, I'll give you an answer only to your question. I would say I hope not, because you don't want everybody to be absolutely rational. Uh, you know, it would make life uh, intolerable. Uh, <laughs> that element of uncertainty, irrationality, we are all irrational sometime or the other. Uh, so I think that's what that's what makes you human also. Otherwise, you'll be a robot. Yes, sir. <laughs> Very true. 
Yeah, there's another question. Are CSIR institutions in India contributing to the development of science? Okay, it's a little. Would you want no, to I take that? I think every institution in India contributes to the development of science in India. I would say this. They contribute to a lesser or greater extent. Uh, within the CSIR institutions, there are institutions which contribute a great deal. There may be other institutions which contribute in different areas. And I think this is true not only of CSIR institutions, true of all government institutions, and now increasingly true of private institutions too. I think we need to support our institutions on a broad scale and we need and the scientific community needs to be responsible for the support that they are getting by ensuring that institutions function to the best possible extent. Yes, sir. So. And I'm just seeing if there's anything that I've missed amongst the questions that have come. Yeah, there's one appreciation for your uh, talk, sir. It says, sir, your lecture is an eye-opener to me on many aspects. Also, I found a nice synthesis of the perspective and importance of several disciplines of science in your lecture. That's, that's, that's one, and then... I think more or less, yes. We've covered all the questions that have uh, come up. There's nothing more, I, I presume. Yes, that's all, that's all for the day. It's been a wonderful session. Um, I think one of the best uh, science talks that I've uh, heard uh and it's been a privilege uh, for all of us to hear you sir on behalf of uh, the breakthrough science society and uh the F jrl family we extend a heartfelt thanks to you for having uh graced this occasion and uh, given a wonderful talk thanks a lot with Thank this, you. Thank you very much. With this we call this a uh, day